even tired. Like I've been flying all over the place for the past, I don't know, I don't even know, like five days or something like that. This morning I was in Valencia, on Monday we were in Barcelona, the weekend I was in Athens. So I'm a little bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I welcome you to the school. We founded this five years ago and it's been a hell of a ride. We've had different things and I'm actually very proud uh, that we've reopened Barcelona on Monday and the teams there are also really cool, so uh, it's going to be fun. As I always say, um, I highly suggest you to at one point actually go to Barcelona and have a class there and meet the guys there. Um, because that's what gives you a little bit of perspective on what the others are actually doing and things like that. I know it's expensive, I know you all guys are start out and you have to get on a train and that kind of thing. You can always drive there. Um, but it's fun, actually the space there is also really nice. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the mother of all boring stuff and probably the kind of thing that's going to be with you for the next six weeks, which is doing working presentations. Okay? You're going to you're gonna hate this. Every time someone says, oh, a pitch, you're going to go like, oh, no, don't talk about that. Okay? But I'm going to try to show, show to you why this is so important, why presenting is one of the key um, skills that you should adopt while doing a startup. And the reason is because a lot of people, when you talk about presentations, you talk about um, presenting, pitching, doing startups, everyone thinks about this. Okay, it's like, oh god, again, I'm going to be on the board and I'm going to have to tell people these are my numbers and this is our financial projections for the next 25 years, whatever that means. Okay, truth is, um, presenting is just a tool. What's really important is being able to be here on stage and first of all, not be uh, cracking your pants, okay? That's kind of important here in Spain. Who, who here is not from Spain? You're from? You're from? You know? Uh, actually, I'm from Russia, but I spent a half year in Europe and half year in Europe. You did? <laughs> and she's from? <laughs> I was kidding, but I'm from the United States. Okay. Thanks. Well, then uh, this is a good benchmark because Russia definitely kind of fills within the Spanish bag of uh, we don't know how to present, you know, since we're little, like everyone's freaking afraid of going in front of everyone to say anything. And uh, <laughs> when you basically look at what uh, the Americans do, it's totally different, you know, since they're very little, they're presenting, they're doing stuff. And so they don't have any, they're not scared of presenting these things. Now this is important <laughs> because you're going to be in a lot of situations where you're going to crack your pants. Okay, so uh, like that kind of contest of cracking pants testing is in order for you to be trained for this. But most importantly is these tools are going to give you a way of understanding your business that you've never had before. I mean, everyone can write a business plan. Everyone can hack a spreadsheet, but when you have to, when you sit here, when you're standing here, and have to defend against a bunch of assholes that are asking you these really, really crappy questions. Like, please, please, don't get me the, make them not ask me this question. Someone in the room will make the question. Okay, so this is a tool that is going to make you really think about your business and find all the kind of tiny holes, tiny loops that your idea has and that your prototype has so that no one else can actually basically ask you something and caught, catch you off guard. Okay, so that's the whole point of this. Forget for a moment the presentations, forget for a moment the slides, forget for a moment, you know, we're going to do demo day, we're going to do whatever. The point here is to learn about your business. And that should be the goal. This is a reflection of how good you know your business. If you do a crap representation, people will automatically translate to he doesn't know his industry. And then it most definitely won't invest. Now, this is the major issue. It's like you start talking with someone and they'll go like, oh, uh, nice to meet you. All I can say is like, uh, this is pretty typical. It's like, okay, you tell me what you're doing. And you're like, mm, uh, 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 mm. Um, uh. And you go like, hey, what's up? Do we present that? Okay, I see. And you keep going like, mm, uh. 
Okay, so this is very typical. I know so many startups that go like, yeah, I just went to the, to the notary to do some paperwork and I bumped into this investor there and he asked me what we were doing and I went like, okay, this happens. This shit happens all the time. Now, I always like to refer to this as the GOAT show, okay? For most of you that are Spaniards, you know what the GOAT show is, okay? Also known as Show de la Cabra. For those of you that are too young, just imagine gypsies, okay? Gypsies, goat, and a keyboard, okay? <laughs> this is very old, I know. And they'll go like, ding, 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 and the goat will start jumping and doing shit. Well, this is you. This is what you need to be doing when you're on a stage. Because you know what? There's so many freaking startups that no one fucking remembers them. You're going to be in gazillion demo days, gazillion startup programs. So you need to make a difference. Because if not, no one is going to remember you. For God's sake, I have the worst memory ever, and every time I walk into an entrepreneur, it's like, yeah, do you remember me? No. Okay, so if that ever happens to you with me, just say like, yeah, we know you, okay? But the point is, when they get to the point where they ask me like, yeah, I'm the founder of blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? Really? Do you want me to remember that? Like, either you made a really big impression on me, and I basically worked with you, or, or your presentation was impressive, and I went to the website and checked it out, or I'm not going to fuck it. So you better become a freaking gypsy, okay? You have to be absolutely stellar on the stage. Now, what's the normal process for startups and ideas and stuff like that? And this is the reason why presenting and doing good presentations is extremely important is, normally you have the moment where people have an idea. Who here is an MBA? One, someone else? Two, okay, with me we're three. So I'm just going to give you shit, okay, MBA is Master Business Administrator, it's basically a master's and you go there and you do this project with a lot of supposedly intelligent people and while you're doing the MBA, if you're an entrepreneur, you start thinking, what the fuck, try to do that in a startup and see what happens, okay. So when you get out, like, all your peers are like, oh yeah, we've done this great, Let, let's launch it. And you're like, okay, just a second. How, many, how much experience do you have in this? Oh, no, but we did, you know, we presented this on the MBA. It's like, okay, but how many businesses have you run? That's not important. You know, we have this humongous spreadsheet. Okay, nice, nice. And that's how a lot of ideas get born and destroyed in the process. Uh, type 2 of idea is the war idea. It's like, this is typically, normally happens around 1 a.m. in the morning not earlier, 1 a.m. in the morning you're already fucking drunk and you start going like, oh my god, we should do, you know what, we should do this game where you take pictures of your feed and people rate them as hot or not. That's gonna be the next big thing. Bad idea, okay? But, you know, some good ideas actually come when you're utterly drunk. Trust me, I know a couple of them. Or you're in a relaxed situation where you just like your mind flies around and you go like, yeah, got it. Now I know what I'm gonna fix. Actually, I had this moment this morning um, with the, I, I was thinking the uh, no, not this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, of course, in the morning, but not at that point. No, I was I was on the on the high speed train from Valencia, and I was talking with a with a founder. And we were just chatting, he was asking me what I was doing, and he said, like, yeah, you know, our problem is this and this and this. And, and I was thinking, yeah, well, we've been thinking about a product. He said, well, you know, a product for doing this. And he just gave me, like, the best freaking idea ever. Now I know what kind of product my company is going to build, thanks to this conversation. We were just relaxed, we were just chatting. This is where ideas happen. The problem with ideas is that no one gives a shit. Okay? Ideas are fucking worthless. And this is the reason. Who likes this picture? Raise your hand, come on, be honest. Come on, be honest. <laughs> there we go. Who well, here is, it has a technical background? Okay, so just keep your hands there. This is honesty, okay? Just don't uh, stop lying to me. And the problem with this is that most startups, except if you're an MBA, of course, most startups will get founded by 
technical people because in most cases you're either doing a mobile app or you're doing a blah blah blah, and there has there is some degree of technology involved in it. So there's always some technical people in the in the team, and the problem is that technical people love this shit. It's like if there was a naked lady crossing across the, the yard, you wouldn't even see it. <laughs> or take the guy. Okay, for the, for the sake of argument. My point is, most people that are technical, they have a lot of problems. Okay? <laughs> you know so who this guy is? <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> Come on, for the nerds. Linux <laughs> the inventor of Linux, the founder of Linux. <laughs> the operating system. So I don't even know that. Who is this guy? Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman, or a fucking fat guy that walks around with 30 feet and a tin can. Whatever. So, you know, this guy is actually trying to explain to you what his business is doing. We, what normally happens when a technical guy tries to let's market or try to build a startup is that most probably they'll go like, you know, my startup is the shit. So, we're going to sell it either way. You know, the problem is, the truth is that most technical people are like this guy. <laughs> you can laugh, but it's true. It's like, okay, present your, your company. No, man, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to copy my idea. Call, call. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of shit. And then you go like, Come on, just like stop coding for a moment and share it with the world. No, it's not ready yet. <laughs> the code is not there, the features are not finished. Fuck you, release it. No, release, no, 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 no. Okay. This is true, you laugh because this is true. Okay, you've been there. You don't want to release stuff because it's not finished, it's not ready, whatever it is. And that causes a lot of issues. Mostly, this is what happens. Is that Oh yeah, you know, we're technically savvy, our product is fantastic, it's going to sell itself. <laughs> and this happens, okay? Actually, this happens, <laughs> okay? So you have to go around saying like, hey, what's up? Why do we have any users? What's going on? Well, what's going on is that you guys are terribly uh, explaining what you're doing. Really bad. Most entrepreneurs are really, really bad at explaining what they're doing. This is a critical thing. Products don't get sold or bought into or used because they're good, but because people know them. <clears throat> of course, if your product is even good, then even better, because they'll pay you more and faster. But that's not the point. If you actually take history, we have Microsoft. Not the best bucket product around, okay? But hey, you know, they have a very good marketing machine. Apple. Who here owns an Apple device? How do you feel yourself with your Apple device? <laughs> no? As we say here, <laughs> we rock, we rock. Apple is like rocking. When you actually look at the interior of these things, they're crap. Okay? They're not, they're not definitely not the best hardware around. Okay? My point is it's I, I hate I'm going to say this, really. I'm a computer engineer and I hate I'm going to say this, but it's all about the fucking marketing. Okay? And this is the truth. If you tell the right story, people use your stuff. If your stuff doesn't work, you will know about it. But if your stuff is the best thing around, but no one uses it, you won't even know that. And that's the whole point of the game. You're not going to get it right the first time, you're not going to get it right the second time, you're definitely not going to get it right the third time either. But, you need people to use it. You need people to tell you that, what the fuck are you building? If you don't explain it, if you, uh, people won't come and use it. Now, when we talk about who should you explain this to, you have different, uh, different people. The first one is obviously the customers, okay, supposed potential customers. The problem you guys have most of the times is, who is your customer? And you people start having this face of, totally and utterly confusing face of, what, a what? What again? You're like, yeah, customer. This guy that's going to pay for what you're doing. Ah, um, a what? <laughs> okay, so this is like a freaking unicorn for most of you, okay? 
The interesting part is these people are going to pay you for what you're building. So you need to know who they are. Every time I ask a startup, like, who is your customer? Well, people, you know, <laughs> people with smartphones. Um, can you be a little bit more precise? Okay, try to be precise about this. Second group is media. Okay, again, there's magical unicorns that write from time to time about round trays and launching apps and stuff like that. Um, and finally, these guys, the investors. Okay, the guys with the money, definitely not in Spain, but somewhere else, <laughs> supposedly. Okay. Hey, I'm happy. They just raised a 40 million round startup in Barcelona. So, yeah, some people actually give money. But they're great. The thing about the audience is that these are really profiles. They're not really people. Okay, so what, what's going to happen is in most audiences, what you're going to have is a combination of profiles. So one person might be an investor, but could also be a potential customer. Okay? Some people can be a journalist, but could also be a potential customer. Or the three of them. Okay? Mike Carrington, the founder of TechCrunch, he's an investor, he's media, and he's a customer. Okay? The thing about this is, do not tell people, you know, the typical quote that I hear over and over is when you're pitching here and you're talking about your startup and someone tells you, we don't get this, the typical answer from the, entre from the entrepreneur is, of course, you don't get it because you're, you're not the target customer. <laughs> okay, that's a moment where the people in the audience go like, fuck. <laughs> and the point is, there's, there's this notion that I call the proxy customer. Which means, even though there might be, as you say, people in the audience that are not your target customer, these people tend to be highly connected. Which means that most definitely might know someone that could be your customer. Now, if I don't know anything about your technology and you give me the finger in the middle of the presentation saying like, fuck anyone that doesn't get what Bitcoin does, then you have a problem because you're actually losing customers. Because if I understand what you're building, I can tell my friends. <coughs> I'll give you a, a, an example that happened some, time, some, some years ago. I was in Portugal and they were giving this presentation and of course, Portuguese, any Portuguese here? <laughs> <laughs> Just delete that part from the video. Um, now, Portugal, this is this is like the extra region we have here in, in Spain. <laughs> and because it's an extra region, they, they do the same shit like Spanish do. Uh, they're much better than us at English. But mysteriously, when they run like most of the startup events, or they used to run the startup events, they, they will default to Portuguese. And so I was there sitting there listening to these freaking Portuguese pitch, pitches, and I was thinking, what the fuck? So I tweeted something about like, I don't understand why you're not pitching in English, so I can actually share it with people. And at that point, Mike Butcher, who is the tech editor for TechCrunch Europe, answered me because he's a friend of mine. And he said like, yeah, that's a pity because that looked really nice. And I'm like, there you go, you just missed a freaking opportunity for me to pitch it to the tech editor of TechCrunch. This is why it is important. Plus, people, these people actually have iPhones and Androids and shit like that, so they actually tweet about what they're listening to, which is even an even bigger audience. Okay, so never forget that. Don't think that because you don't have the right audience, it's not going to help you. Now, typical pitch problems that happen all the time. Number one. What the fuck are you talking about, okay? Shut the fuck up. If you cannot tell me what you're doing in 30 seconds, you shouldn't be pitching, okay? People that take 25 minutes to explain what they're doing clearly show that A, they haven't done any training, B, they haven't done any homework, and C, they have no fucking idea about their industry. Because if you know your industry, it takes you 30 seconds to explain what you're doing, okay? So, train. And this is part of why you're here. But train hard. I was talking with Jimmy, who is the, the one that runs uh, the Barcelona edition. And he's always very passionate about this stuff. And he was pissed with some of the teams. He said that, oh my god, we've done two sessions and they're still doing these mistakes. Well, Carmen doesn't go so ballistic, but she will think this stuff too. Okay? <laughs> my point here is that, bust your asses. This is not easy. Okay, doing a good presentation takes a lot of effort. Presenting quickly and efficiently takes a lot of effort. So, train. My first suggestion would be 
train and pitch to someone that has nothing to do with your industry. If it's a she, even better. Okay? And this is the reason. People think that I always make this, that I make this like some kind of joke, but it's not true. Okay, men are fucking simple. So when we have a good idea and we do this presentation, we go in what I call gorilla mode. Okay, which is like, oh my god, this is awesome. Ooh, yeah. And then you go and present this and you pitch this to your partner, to your girlfriend, to your mom, to your sister, and she looks at you and she goes like, are you stupid or what? You go like, no, but this is awesome. No, it's not. Yeah, no, but I talk with my friends and they said it's awesome. Your friends. <laughs> okay, so trust me, this is not, I'm not joking here. Pitch it to the female population and someone that's actually detached or removed from your industry. The other ones that if they don't get it, you're doing it wrong. Trust me, if you tell it to your mom and your mom gets it, you're nailing your presentation. That is your goal. That should be your benchmark. I don't care about the audience, I don't care that your mom is not technical, that she's not an investor. She's your mom, okay? And if she has to tell you, I don't understand what you're talking about, she will tell you that, okay? It's unfit to love, what we call it. Now, the second typical issue that I see over and over again is the use of technical work. And you guys, there's a couple of startups here that are highly technical. I believe who are the big card thing? The card. Okay, this guy. Yeah? I should have known. You're wearing hackathon t-shirts, so... Um, for God's sake, for those of you that are highly technical, please, I don't want to hear anything about QR, QR or NFC, bullshit like that. That is danger. That is the typical kind of words that you're going to put in the presentation and you're going to lose some of the audience. Your mom definitely is not going to understand that. So try to explain it in a different way. This is not about, there's always a way of explaining this without using these bullshit words. I would say the same. Now, I keep hearing all these presentations where the entrepreneur starts and they go like, yeah, so what are you presenting? Oh yeah, hello, my name is Alex and I'm building a social mobile app for social. And you go like, what? Yeah, what is that? You know, we are the future of social mobile app social. Can you add an extra word there? Like, is this some kind of game where you just draw? <coughs> now, let's put big data in there, so it's even nicer. Okay, we're the social, mobile, social, end-to-end, -end big data startup. Okay, and you're like, okay, now, what about telling me what the fuck are you solving? Okay, this is so typical. First line, first pitch from a startup is saying, we are the future of the music on the internet. Okay, thank you very much. So what are you doing exactly again? Now, being social is not a feature. If in 2014 you are not social, you're just bloody retarded. Okay? This 10 years ago, it was a feature. Today it's not. Having a mobile app is not a feature either. Except in very few cases. Okay, so do not pitch the same as, oh my god, we're doing it in Android. Yay! Okay, this is not important. I don't care. I want to listen to what actually, what are you building? What are you solving? Now the finally and most important one is, I've been sitting here listening to pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch, after pitch and you know I have a spoon next to me and I'm, I've been literally trying to take my eyeballs out at every point and trying to kill me with a spoon and at one point you go like, so why the fuck should I care about your startup? Like, why am I sitting here listening to all this crap? Now, if there is one question, if there is one point that people need to take out from your presentation, is this one. Is why do you matter? Why are you building what you're building? Why are you doing what you're doing? Now, scenery, typical scenery from a pitching competition is, okay, and we're going to see this later, Trust me, no matter what I tell you, you're going to do it. I just keep putting these lights and starting to, I don't know, fill some space here because I know you're going to make those mistakes. Just remember, because there's a lot of teams, whenever you see one of your peers making a mistake, just raise your hand and tell them, I told you so, okay? Something like that. Just make them remember. 
What do startups normally do is the first thing is I'll tell you what I am. So I'm a social mobile app. And you go like, okay, so what? It's like, well, so we're building an application that's using big data and that's connected to a remote Hadoop server that's going to send in this shit there and that shit there. So a user and a customer in Australia can do this and that. Okay. So what the fuck are you building? Wrong structure. Exactly. You should first tell me why are you building this? What is the point? I'll give you an example. There's a team in Barcelona, which supposedly, I'm assuming because I haven't seen it, has a fantastic technology for zooming in and zooming out. On Monday, it was like, so why are you doing this? No, because restaurants and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but why are you doing this? And in the end, they basically told us, well, the thing is, we have this amazing technology and we don't know what to do with it. And I'm like, okay, so that is a problem. Okay, so find your problem. Tell me what are you solving? The number one thing you need to say. Why am I doing this? A why is not a what. Remember this. You'll see how every single presentation that starts here is nearly most probably going to start with a what we do, not why we do it. Now, it's extremely important that you always understand who's sitting there. And you're going to experience it during the six weeks, but it's really important always to um, perceive what the others are perceiving. So the first thing that you need to understand is if you ever see an investor, do not pitch them. Okay? They're fucking tired of pitches. I can tell you, they pitch me all the time and I don't even have money. Okay? It's like, why the fuck are you talking to me? Like, I don't give a shit. Oh yeah, but like you're editor of this blog and maybe you can write this. Like, have you even actually read our editorial guidelines? <coughs> we don't write about startups. Then why the fuck are you pestering me? This is why I'm taking a pee. Okay? So I have my dick in my hands. And this guy's pitching me. It's like, really? Really? You're pitching me here, right here, right now? This is a real story, by the way. I'm not inventing <laughs> it. It's like, okay, man. So do not pitch them. Now, talk with them. If you have a conversation, the question will eventually happen. And the question would be, oh, so what do you do? And at that point, you tell them what you do. Do not go roaming around pitching people, okay? So just so you get what is the life of an investor. Well, these people, they get pitched between 20 to a lot more, depending on the country you are, times a day. That's exhausting. That's really tiring. And most of the tiring, what it means is that most probably whatever you're pitching, they've either invested or they've seen before. Carmen was saying this before, like we've seen so many projects just here in Tenham Valley that every time I see a startup, it's like I've seen three different versions of, of someone doing this. And it's okay, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. The, the real deal is about execution, so it's fine that you've seen it before. It's just like, if you try to pitch this like, hey, we are building a revolutioning blah blah blah, the investor's going to look at you and say, like, yeah, sure, you're revolutioning the mobile solo move space, yeah, whatever, okay? So don't be fancy, don't think you're going to be smart, don't use smart words, just get to the point. Tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it differently. <coughs> And again, do not use fluffy words. Do not throw the end to end, we are doing the big data thing. They don't care. Those are marketing terms. What I want to know is what are you solving and how much money can you make? Okay, two questions. Very easy question. Media. They normally get pitched slightly less, but the pitch is normally worse. So with an investor, you normally do a one-to-one, -one, so you will pitch the investor and you will have at least some kind of, some degree of human connection. When it comes to the press, you guys go crazy. And you, you basically write this outlandish press release that's fucking ugly, that's fucking boring, and there's like three pages in extension, and you send it to every email you find that finishes with like tech whatever, okay? Now, the problem with journalists is that, apart from being pitched and getting a lot of press releases every day, they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. It's like, yeah, we're building this and this and this. They go like, what are you talking about? 
Most journalists, they have no idea about technology. Most people that run technology blogs do not know anything about technology. I'll just give you a guess. Everyone here knows TechCrunch? Who doesn't know TechCrunch? Raise your hand. TechCrunch. Oh no, don't be afraid. Just raise your hands. The ones that don't know it. Okay, homework for you. Check it out because it's the largest tech blog in the world. So if you want to get featured on specific kind of instances, this is the place where you go. Now, who is the founder of TechCrunch? No one? This again, second homework for you guys. If you ever want to get covered by the media, at least know the name of the people that publish shit in the media, okay? Mike Arrington. And if you had to take a guess of what what's Mike's profession, what would that be? He's the founder of TechCrunch. Okay. He's been writing about technology for years. What do you think is his profession? I guess. God, he's good. MBA. <laughs> I know you. He's a fucking lawyer. He's a freaking lawyer. How is, it How is it possible that a lawyer built and launched the largest tech site in the world? Of course, now he knows a lot about technology, but at the very beginning, trust me, he had no fucking idea what he was talking about. So, Take this into account when you're pitching, when you're sending something to a journalist, because most probably then you will get published, but with a very different idea to the one you pitched to the journalist, okay? And you'll be like, no, 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 this is not what we're doing. Okay, your fault. Okay? Now, and the third thing that is important is that these people have a tight schedule. They have to publish X amount of posts a day, which means they don't have time to do any research. Now, if you don't give me the data about whatever you're pitching me, I'm not going to go and look for it. So give it to me. So if you're talking about your startup, give me your logo, give me a link to your website, give me your Twitter, give me your blog. If you've been published before, give me the links where you've been published before. Do not make me go and look for them. Okay, if you make me look for them, you know what's going to happen? Because I'm not going to look for them. Okay, so I'm just going to archive you anymore. Or leave it there until it kind of goes down on the screen and you don't see it anymore. And finally, journalists, what they do is they sell to their audience. So I'll give you just one quick hint. If you ever want to be published, whatever you're writing to the journalist, think about this in, in this way. If I saw this published on a website, would I care? Would I actually read it? If your answer is no, do not send it. This is very typical when someone launches a new version of their app. Oh, we're going to get covered. We're going to tell TechCrunch stuff. We just launched a new version of our app. Like, would you fucking care if Dropbox published something saying like, Hey, we are we are releasing version 1.100018. Who would read that? Someone? Either you work at Dropbox or at the competition, or you wouldn't care. Well, this is the same with your with your startups. Launching is not news. <clears throat> Creating a new version is not news. You have to give me a story to work with. If you don't give it to me, people are not going to read it. And because I'm a journalist and I want to sell to my audience, my audience is not going to care, so I'm not going to publish it. Okay? Always think about that. Send them something that you would really like to see, that you would really like to read. On the media. Now let's go to the structure of how do you do a page set. Now I'm going to go a little bit more specific here. So this is based on what's called the Kawasaki rule, which is a guy that's called Guy Kawasaki. Someone knows it? You guys know him? <coughs> Sounds familiar? Motorbikes. Could be motorbikes, but not. <laughs> uh, so Guy Kawasaki, he's a uh, he used to be the chief evangelist for Apple, like in the 80s, and now he's a business angel and investor in Silicon Valley. And he has a very good book, which I highly recommend you, which is called The Art of Start. And in it, he talks about something called the Kawasaki Rule, which is a 10, 20, 30. So basically he says, anytime you pitch someone, you need to address 10 questions, 10 points that people are going to have in their minds in 20 minutes with 30 uh, point size fonts. 
Okay, this is not really right now when he said this, there weren't that many startups, which meant that most investors would actually give you 20 minutes. Now you get around five if you're lucky and around four if you're unlucky. Okay? So this should be more like a 10 for 30 rule. The 30 size point is important. Okay? Because what do you think is the average age of the investors? Have a guess. 40? 50. Um, 40, 50, 40 something. So what happens when you're 40 something? You don't have time. Apart from not having time. But physically speaking, you can't sleep. You get blind at the fucking hole. Okay? Which means that if you use a tiny font like this from here, at the, at the end, at the, at the bottom, they're not going to read it. People at the back of the room, they don't read it. They cannot read it. So always make sure that you have big fonts. If you ever do business cards, for God's sake, big fonts. Do not give me a business card that I need a fucking magnifying glass to read your email. Okay? The same applies here. So what does this structure look like? This is the 10 questions you need to answer. This is the 10 points that need to be addressed in those 5 minutes. If someone gets out of the room, with any question about these 10 points, you screwed your presentation. Okay? These are not slides, they are points, which means that for well, the number one, I could have between one to gazillion slides to cover that point. Okay? So it's not like I'm going to do a presentation with 10 slides. We'll have a lot more. Tell them that we are going to give them the, the slides because they, they are all making pictures of yours. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's lines that they're going to be uploaded. But either way, no, I, I like that they take pictures. Even if for whatever reason they don't find slides here or whatever, at least you have a picture. And if I'm in them, even better, okay? Now, the thing is, as I say, these are, these are points. These are not slides. Now, guess what? What is the number one thing that people are going to ask when you come on a stage? Someone? How do you make what, what did you guys thought when I came here on stage at the beginning? What, what, the hell is say? what the hell is going to say? Or? Who are you? Who am I? Why are you here? Something what? else changed you through your mind. What do you do? Something else. Why do you have a hat? There you go. Everyone thought that, like, what the fuck? Yeah. Why is this guy wearing a hat? Okay, that's the number one thing that you, your brain is asking, like, who the fuck is this guy that's wearing a hat? Okay? Well, this is the same thing. If you come on stage, the first thing is, like, who the fuck is this guy and what is he going to talk about? Now, that is the reason why the number one thing you need to answer is the problem. Why am I here? Why should you care? Okay? You see, the present presenting, specifically this kind of pitch deck, basically follow a question and answer structure. So these points are not here, they're not ordered in an arbitrary way. There's actually a logic to it. And the logic is like a chain, uh, a connected answer-response structure. So when a common stage, you're wondering, what the fuck is he going to talk about? I'll tell you the problem. The next thing they're going to think, they're going to think is like, okay, I get the problem, so what's the solution? Okay, this is natural human reasoning. Now, the number one, as I said, is why am I here? Once you've supposedly, supposedly, because most of you do this really bad, supposedly illustrated the problem, the number two thing is, okay, so you seem very confident that that's a problem, so how are you going to solve it? And here's where you introduce the what. You remember, first we said the why, and here you tell me the what. Okay? What do you do? The solution. Most people will directly start with the solution. What do we do? No. Why do you do it first, and then you give me the solution? What do I do? If at that point I actually believe you, okay, if the problem in my mind is actually real, and not something that you've invented, like most times, okay, you guys will come here and you will go like, yeah, and there's this problem, and it's like, who has this problem? Well, I have it. Who else has it? Me? No, but who else? My friends? Okay? 
And so if I kind of believe that, the next question I'm going to ask is like, okay, so how many idiots like you are around? Now, I always hear personally, I always tell people the same thing. Your mom is not a market. Okay? Repeat with me. Your mom is not a market. And for that sake, your friends are not a market either. Okay? So I, here, you need to convince me that this problem that you're talking about happens to a lot of people. The more people that this, they, the more people that ask for this problem, the better it's going to be. The more painful the problem is, and the more you can prove me that there's a lot of pain in that market, the better it's going to be. Okay? Sometimes it's going to be hard for you to find the numbers. So this is the reason why I always tell you here, get the fuck out of the building. Okay? If you don't go and get rid of numbers, it's very difficult to prove this. It's very difficult to prove that this actually happens to people. Now, if you come on stage and you go and I tell you, okay, this thing, these are the typical problems that happen to startup, you're going to ask like, yeah, like, how many startups have this issue? If I had numbers here, which one day I'll bring them, I'll tell you, out of all the demo days that happen in Europe, like 90 something percent of the, of the presentations lack this, this, and this. And this is measured by this source, and because we've done a survey, and because we've been to these 20 events during this time period. That is data. It's hard to refute data. So the more data you have, the better you're going to be there. Now at that point, I go like, okay, there's a problem. Supposedly you have a, so a solution, not the solution, but at least a solution. You just told me that there's people that are willing to pay you for that? Okay. Now, if there's that much, pe that much people, who else is playing there? Like if there's that money to make, there has to be someone else. So this is the point where you actually talk about the competitors. Do not be shy. If you reach this point and you go all fucking Indiana Jones on people saying, hey, we don't have competitors. People are going to stand up, laugh, and leave. There's always competitors. There's no such thing as no competition. Except if you just have this stupid, really stupid idea where if you don't find competition, you're doing it wrong. Trust me. Okay? There's always competition. Starting from Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. They can pivot at any time and screw you. Okay? So there's always a competition. Talk about it here. And most important, more important than talking about the competition, especially if you are doing a startup in a very crowded niche, is make sure you explain to me how are you different from them. What makes you different? And trust me, putting the background with a different color is not differentiation. Calling yourself a different thing is not being different. Too many times you talk with someone is, what are you doing? We're doing a new social network for freaking cats. Okay, so how are you different from Facebook? Oh, we're called Catface. Okay, and what else? Nothing else. The cat can upload with the mobile phone, you know, <laughs> the ship. And you're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Okay, so if you're in a really competitive space, make sure you show how different you are. The more you can show there, the better it's going to be. Because the problem is at that point, if you don't tell me how different you are, I'm going to say, okay, so precisely you are like Facebook. Oh, no, no, but we are not like Facebook. Like, why are you... We, why aren't you like Facebook? Oh, because we can do this thing with groups. And you go like, okay, but can I do that with Facebook too? Well, yeah, but we have a, like a short link to do that. And you go like, yeah, so how much faster can I do that with your thing? Well, yeah, it's like, you know, 30 seconds faster. And you go like, okay, so let me get this straight. You don't have any backing. You just created this company out of the blue that allows me to do this tiny thing that I only do once a year on Facebook and it only makes it 30 seconds faster. Fuck you, okay? That's what the customers are going to say. Because I have to create a new learning curve for your product. So make sure you, sh you tell me how different you are. If there isn't enough differentiation, people aren't going to buy it. As simple as that.
And finally, we reach the fantastic point where, okay, I believed all this, this thing, and here's where the capitalism mentality kicks in. What do you think I'm thinking right now? No? Money, what? How to make money? How do you say that? Profitability. No. How do you get customers? No. I'll give you a hint, Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. There you go. Show me the fucking money. Too many companies reach this point, they finish a 10, 10 minute, not even five, 10 minute presentation, and you go like, so how are you gonna make money? How the fuck is it possible that you were there for 10 minutes and you forgot to say how you're going to make money? Okay, this is fantastic. You're pitching to investors and you're not telling them how they're going to make money. Yes. So cool. Very bad. Tell me how are you going to make money. And trust me, there's like 20 kinds of ways of doing money. There's not more. Okay? I either do direct sales, or I have a freemium model, or I have a sponsoring model, or I have a transaction model, or I do software as a service, or I do a subscription model. There's not that many. So it's just a matter of combining several of them. But just tell me how you're going to make money. Number seven is okay, I believe all this crap that you just told me. I basically had a nice laugh when you said that you're going to make this kind of companies pay for your thing because I still don't believe it. And at this point it's like, okay, I have an idea how you're going to make money. So now I need you to tell me what is the scale and how fast are you going to reach specific goals. So here's a point where you're going to tell me how your sales are going to go. So if you already have sales, it's great because you can show real data. What's going to happen in most cases is you don't have sales. So you're going to have to do spreadsheet magic and do some sales projection. This is what they teach you at an MBA, how to do this. Okay, it's just like copy, paste, okay, and that leads you... Normally, I keep telling people, the usual is to put one year. Anything beyond six months, it's hard to believe. But actually, anything beyond three months is hard to believe, but, you know, six months is acceptable. One year is a stretch, you go like, yeah, well, okay, you can see it. Three years is like, <laughs> what the fuck are you smoking? Okay, but there's always a idiot in the room. There's always a retarded, people, a retarded person in the room that's going to tell you if you show them a one year projection, they're going to raise their hand and they're going to go like, oh, what about a five year projection? And you go like, okay, this is the stupid room. Okay, don't worry. Just copy and paste it more times in the spreadsheet. Take a picture and put it at the back. So if you ever have the idiot asking you this question, just show them this life. It's like, yeah, there you go. Just have fun with it. Project whatever you need to project here. Now, if you get to this point and you tell me that you're going to sell this to 10 million users in one year, then again, I'm going to start laughing at you. Okay? The point here is not to have it right. This is not about guessing the number and going after a year, hey, you know, we said 10 million and we have 10 million. That's not the point. This point is to show that you're not a psychopath. The point is to show that you're not retarded either. That you actually didn't pull that number out of thin air. And we've had startups here that they've gone like, so why are you going to make two million the first year? And this is a true story. And they said, because it looks nice. <laughs> like, you know, Facebook mom was like, you're kidding me, right? Like, no, you know, we had to put a number, so two million looked like nice. <laughs> and you go like, okay. Just for the record, this is the kind of stupid answer that you guys normally go when someone asks you, okay, so what is your market share? It's like, yeah, we're gonna go to China and we're gonna be we're gonna get one percent of the market there. It's like, do you even know any maths? Like, do you know what one percent of China is, dude? Like, really? Really? So here, you only need to prove that you're not stupid. Okay? So just I mean, and being stupid would mean either put it too large or the opposite, saying, hey, you know, in one year we're going to have 10 customers. It's like, what? Okay, be a little bit more ambitious. So, don't be stupid. Something in between. Now, the marketing part is, okay, you just told me that you're going to have 10 million users, so how the fuck are you going to do that? And here, here is probably my favorite point of a presentation, where people get very serious and go like, hey, this is our marketing strategy. Uh, 
we're going to do social media. And you're like, what? Social media? She said, wow, that's one hell of a strategy, okay? And if you keep asking, it's like, okay, so what exactly is social media? It's like, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, maybe. You're like, okay, this is about strategy, okay? A lack of strategy, it's called brute forcing. Okay, this is if you ask someone like, what's your strategy for marketing? And you'll go like, media? It's like, yeah, but what, do, what are you going to do in media? Well, media? It's like, well, but there has to be some kind of strategy. This is the same. Do not tell me that you're going to do social media. What exactly? What channels in social media are you going to use? What kind of, are you going to do campaigns? Are you going to do discounts? What are you going to do with social media? Social media is a channel. It's not a tool. Okay? Now, the second version of this point is a moment where either someone goes like, our strategy is word of mouth. We go like, good luck with that. And the second one is like, here it comes. We're going to do a viral video. And you go like, yeah, sure, we're going to do that. Two times in a row, actually. Okay. Virality is a consequence, just for the record, okay? It might happen or it might not. Actually, most definitely, it won't. You might be lucky and actually have something that goes viral, but it's not the usual thing. Now, the marketing part has to show a strategy. You, you don't have a lot of time, which means you cannot stay there and <coughs> just show me a little bit of your ideas of how you're going to reach there. And finally, we are talking about the team. The team is not a slide, it's not a point where you basically tell me how many chess contests you won when you were a fucking kid. I couldn't care less. This is not the place where you say that you won the 2013 Frisbee tournament in California. I don't give a shit, except if you're building a Frisbee star. Then I do care. Okay? So the point here is you need to show me who your team is and why they're capable of executing all these things you just told me. So you need to connect it with something in their past that illustrates why they are the right person to do this. Many people will tell you that no, no, no. Many mentors, no one tell the startups this. Oh no, no, we want the team at the very beginning. You know, the first line should be the team. What do you think that is retarded? If you don't know what the problem is and what the solution, what the technology is, you don't know if the team is going to actually be able to do it. Exactly. Okay, it's a bunch of people, but I don't know if they're good at what they're doing because I don't know what they should be doing. Okay? So there's a point, there's a reason why this structure has this order. You can definitely move some parts, but always remember that they have to be connected with the previous point. Because my brain keeps, make, keeps asking questions. Okay? So the team, again, nice pictures, please. Don't put crappy pictures that are really tiny and a lot of text, okay? This is where you display your team, big pictures, big faces, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Finally, nine milestones and projections, essentially is what have you done to date and what are you gonna do in the future? Advice here, being accepted in Tenement Valley is not a milestone, okay? Um, Buying a domain name is not a fucking milestone either. Designing our logo is not a milestone. Okay? I know that this is the kind of crap that you guys put at the beginning because you don't have anything else to put. So it's like, hey, we, we took a shit today. Milestone. Okay? We went running. Milestone. Okay? No. As long, the, the more you start moving towards um, product and uh, market fit and product validation, you need to give me metrics. You need to give me milestones that have relation to your customers. If you have one paying customer, that's a milestone. Okay? If you have traction, even if a little bit, growth x over x, that's, that's a milestone. Okay? If you have two pilots running with two big customers, that's a milestone. That is the kind of thing you need to show here. Obviously, when you begin, you don't have anything. Okay? But try to start removing those crappy milestones as you start getting real things done. This is typical, I also mentor the YRA teams, this is typical from YRA, it's like, what have you done? Hey, we participated in Startup Weekend, and we got accepted by YRA. It's like, people are going to laugh at you if you put that shit, okay? <laughs> now, projections, this is the moment where 
there's a big difference between the U.S. and Europe. Um, so in the U.S., when you ask someone like, "What is the future version of the stock of the startup?" they go like, "Oh, we're gonna we're already in talks with the New York Times, with the Wall Street Journal, with the Washington Post, with this is we." They go like, oh yeah, the New York Times, what are you talking at the New York Times? It's like, yeah, well the thing is, we have a friend of a friend of a friend that cleans the bathrooms at the New York Times. <laughs> so we're getting an introduction to the cleaning manager there, and from there we're going to skin it up until we reach the CEO. That is true US mentality, okay? Take it to Europe, where you ask someone, especially from Southern Europe, you ask them, okay, so what are your projections, what are you going to do in the future? It's like, well, yeah, right now we're making this work on our neighborhood. So uh, I think in like in three months we'll extend to the next neighborhood, and I think about the end of the year we probably can do like the uh, you know the surrounding areas of the city, and in a year and a half we expect to go international to either Gibraltar or Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but this is so fucking typical. So here, be ambitious, have goals, think big. It's actually easier to put this into play elsewhere than in your own local market. Always. Always. Okay, so be ambitious. Put, I mean, don't go crazy. I've had people that say like, yeah, projections that we're going to expand to the, to the whole humanity of the 21st century. What the fuck is wrong with you, man? Like, okay, so just, just don't go too crazy here. But just show that you're thinking, the reason why we do this in English is because we wanted this program to be international. If, if we didn't want that, we would have done it in Spanish. So the point here is that think beyond your local boundaries. Think beyond your local community. Mm -hmm. Start thinking, for me, every time they ask me, like, so what do you think about Europe? It's like, it's a big country. Okay? For me, it's not, it's not a continent anymore. It's a country that has different provinces, that have different culture, and some of them have different currencies, and stupid, they drive on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> <laughs> that happen. That's a different thing, okay? And finally, to close the presentation, there's this thing, radical thing, it's called call to action. Call to action, basically, I remind you how badass we are, how painful the problem is, how cool our solution is, and how much money you're going to do with it, okay? It's basically a reminder of, you know, remember, remember, remember me, remember me, remember the milk, remember the milk, remember the milk. Actually, the good presentations have call to actions at every point. So every two or three slides, I'll tell you, okay, if you ever have a need to tell a story, you call the guy with the hat. If you ever need to tell a story, you call the guy with the hat. So once you get out of here, if you ever need to tell a story, you call the guy with the hat. This is a call to action. This is what's called branding. And this is what you need to make yourself different, to help people remember you. Another tip, do not choose a stupid, crazy name that no one can pronounce. Trust me, I've done it, very bad idea. Okay? <laughs> Try to get something that people can pronounce, that you don't need like three different kind of degrees to understand what the hell you're talking about. Something that people can immediately tell someone, oh yeah, there's this startup in Spain or there's this startup in Germany, that it's called blah blah blah, and they do this, you should talk with them. That's what you want. Okay? So this is what it's all how to go from problem to solution. Skip it. This we talked about. This is a different way of doing. We can permute some of the elements. So imagine I'm using a story to illustrate this structure. So I will go like, oh, okay. So David, every time he goes to his job, this is what happens. Blah blah blah. And you know he, that's really painful for him because he's losing time doing this and that. And he's tried everything. He's tried Dropbox, he's tried Box.com, he's tried, uh, how do you call the, how do you call the Microsoft one? SkyDrive? No one uses it. So he's tried SkyDrive, blah, blah, blah. So essentially I'm talking about my competitors. I permutate it because the story I'm talking about allows me to switch them. But there is a connection with the previous point, okay? Then I keep talking about market, and then I might talk about our solution. That he's tried all of this, and then, well, we show them what we're doing. We went like, oh, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Because this is different because it has this, 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 and this technology. You see how you connect the things? So, this is a reference, this is a framework. Don't take it as it has to be like this. You can change some of the structure, 
but always remember that there is a logic to it. A presentation is about flow. If you come on stage and you go like, okay, let me tell you about the problem. And then one of your co-founders goes on stage and goes like, I'm going to talk about the solution. And now we're going to talk about business model. And now we're going to talk about the market. You totally destroy the presentation. Also, do not ever let the CTO pitch. Okay? They're really bad at doing this, normally. There are few exceptions. But I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of letting several people pitch at the, in the same presentation. Because there's always someone that's better than the other. And that difference, if it's too big, you kill the presentation. I've seen presentations where the CEO of the company was on stage, he was like, this is the share, and boom, 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 and boom, boom. And suddenly at one point he goes, I'm now going to introduce you my amazing CTO, and this fat guy with a beard comes on stage and he goes like, hello, I'm going to tell you about our technology. And he goes like, no, no, this is not happening. You just kill the presentation. Okay? So be aware of this. Always put the, the person that pitches the best on stage. Use the force. Don't be an idiot. Use the person that's better at this. Things that you shouldn't do from a design point of view. For God's sake, there's this call, this thing that's called advanced ser no, search tools on Google. When you go to Google Images, search tools, image size, big. Okay, you got, you got that? Big. I don't want to, want to see pixels there. The same one watermarks, they're lame. Do not put images with watermarks. People see them. You know, they're there for a reason. <laughs> for people to go like, oh, you didn't buy this image, okay? So, and for God's sake, okay? I put an obvious thing, but do not use comic sans. Do not use Time New Roman, okay? There's a lot of other fonts that you can use, and for God's sake, do not use colors, okay? I don't know what happened in our generation that everyone was on vacation when Season Street talked about the color combinations. Everyone was on vacation. I don't know what happened, but it's amazing. There's this thing that called color palette, and yellow with black, it hurts. Okay? <laughs> Blue with black, it fucking hurts. Okay? If you have a dark logo and a dark background, no one can read it. Not even you. So when you come on stage and I ask you, can you read your own logo? No, I can't. Then why the fuck did you put it that color, okay? So just <coughs> try and read it and see if it works or not. Except that, you can use colors, but just be zen about the colors, okay? Don't go all crazy in them. This is a list of don'ts do about presenting. I talk about some of them. Do not put more than three words on the slide. Because if you put more than three words, what you're going to do, oh, basically it's a translation of, I didn't do my homework, so I don't know what I was going to talk about here, so I'm going to turn around and I'm going to read the screen. Okay? So three words max, normally. Do, don't put shitty images. If you put a graph, have a source. Okay? This is uh, school 101. Science 101. If you're quoting someone, put a source. Put the, your contact information on the final slides. Too many companies just say like, okay, thank you, and we're done. Like Carmen said today, we're done. No, you're not done. It's like, and now we're gonna have an amazing presenter. Don't do, do say like, okay, now you clap. Okay, no, there's a flow to this, and at the back you have to have your contact information. And I'm gonna even give, go one step further, is my suggestion is that you put a footer with your Twitter name and your email, or your URL. Because normally the audience is watching, and at one point they're going to go like, Oh, oh, that's very cool, I want to tweet about it. If I don't have your Twitter, you will screw the name as I do every single time. And then I have the startup coming to me, giving me shit, saying like, Oh, thank you very much for tweeting, but our Twitter handler is nothing that has to do with the name of the company. That normally happens. And it's like, ah, you know what, fuck you, it's your fault for not putting the Twitter when you should have put the Twitter. Okay? People do that, so put it. Um, don't put weird combinations, stick to white and black combinations most of the times. Don't use tiny fonts. Careful with the live demos, you're going to do live demos and they're going to go crazy. Okay, make sure, first of all, if you're going to do a live demo, make sure that it works. Try to avoid them as much as possible because normally the internet tends not to work. If you're going to do a video, I don't know if I have it there, it's the next one. If you're going to use a video, make sure you've, you've tried it before. Make sure that the speed is right. 
what we've seen so many times here in Thailand Valley is I click on the video and the video starts going like and I go like just a second. You have to press space to 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 freeze the video. So make sure it's done. Suggestion with the videos: do not record how you log in into your system. No one gives a shit about that. Show me the parts that are important. I'm telling you because I did that in many of my videos until I said like, this is so stupid, no one cares about this, okay? So, I'm talking from my experience. Do not rely on the internet. Um, don't put tables. Okay, if you're going to talk about uh, financial projections, there is no time to read a table. If you're going to send this to someone, then definitely put tables. They're going to have the time to, to scroll through the numbers. If you have a presentation and you have four minutes, there's no way in hell I can read a table. Do not use 3D graphs. They look really nice on your laptop when you're watching them. When you're over there, they look like crap. Okay, the whole shadow thing makes them really bad to actually see the data. Do not use fancy transitions. And this is not <coughs> the reason for this. Sometimes I, what happened here is I bring my own laptop and this guy told me, no, 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 you put this on a pen drive and we'll play it on a laptop. You know what normally happens is I've been using fancy transitions and suddenly the laptop has less memory and less power than my laptop and so when I when I hit the clicker the screen will freeze and I'll go like huh click 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 and 30 seconds later my slides will go like okay oh sorry sorry let's go back and going back the same shit happens okay you click once and you go like oh shit click 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 and you keep going back and forth back and forth back and forth waste of time you have Precious time when you're on stage, don't waste it. Don't use fancy shit. Make it just work. This is a PDF. You don't need anything else. Now, finally, add graphs. If you add the graphs, put titles to the graph. Like, what am I seeing? Don't put numbers on the axis and just say, like, okay, this is a very interesting graph. It's like, okay, what, bananas and potatoes? What is it? What am I seeing? What are the units? If you put numbers, what are the units? Don't tell me, we're going to make 2,000. <coughs> okay, 2,000 what? Dollars? Euros? 2,000K? What is it? I know this is pretty obvious. I'll actually suggest you to print the screen, and when you're going through your presentation, just keep ticking to see if you're doing this or not. Okay? And finally, remember to be a gypsy. A fun, make it entertaining, make it <coughs> remarkable. Make it rememberable. Thank you, guys. You have my Twitter account there, you have my email there if you want to ask questions. Highly suggest you to go to the blog from Press42. I have a bunch of articles about using storytelling for presentations, how to design presentations, things to do, things not to do, typical mistakes that people do while trying to use stories with a presentation. Excellent. Okay. Do we have some time for questions or the pizza is? Um, no pizza today. No pizza today. Okay. But, uh, yeah, the food is here. So if you okay. want, if you want questions, go ahead. Questions? Really? No questions? You know how this goes, don't you? I ask you questions. No one raises their hand. Now I'm gonna step out. And you motherfuckers, there's gonna be three people waiting here. To talk about it. And those of you that don't come now, I'm gonna fucking email you. Okay? And I tend to spend like three months to answer emails, so you don't want that. So I ask again questions. You're gonna regret this. Really? Mañana. Mañana? Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, thank I, don't, you. I don't hear late, uh, Alex, but. How long will you say for a for an amateurish uh, or a non-trained uh, pitch deck to, to prepare the pitch, a five uh, five minute pitch? How long do you think we shall devote to it? That's a very good question. I would say something between between two to four days, minimum two days. It's a minimum amount of time you need. To build it, to research, to get good pictures, to put the style right, to train, to test it, to pitch it to someone. That's for a normal one. If you do it in two days, you're going to have issues with time. So, suggestion is to try it, work on it for four days, so the two next days you can actually start removing things. So, you pitch to people, 
you see how they react? You can ask them, like, what do you think is redundant? What can I remove from here that didn't really give you any information? So you start actually like a, I'm going to all shred on you guys now, like an onion, you start peeling the layers and you start removing content from the presentation until you can fit it. My suggestion would be fit it into four minutes because there's normally two cases. The nervous guy that will go on stage and instead of four minutes, instead of five minutes, they'll pitch on two and a half because they will go like boom, 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 because they get very nervous. But the most normal situation is that because you're nervous, you're going to get stuck at some point and it's going to take longer. So try to aim for four minutes, four minutes and a half, something like that, to give you a little bit of margin. And that thinning down of the presentation normally takes takes a couple of days. So do not leave it till the very end. Again, um, we saw this in Barcelona. The worst presentation on Monday was with someone that they recognized me at the end that they had had no time to prepare it, so they did it yesterday. So that was on Sunday uh, for two hours. And of course, you know what happens is that when the other teams go on stage and they've done the effort of actually working on it, um, it will look like crap, the one that has been worked. When I talk about four days, I'm not talking about four days full time because you guys are, being, are going to be doing a lot of things. This is not about like a press of the presentation, but it matters. You know, this is your screen to people, so it matters when you invest time in making it good. No more questions? What do you think is the most critical part of the pitch? For me, there's um, essentially two, two or three questions that need to be there. The number one is why are you doing it? The number two thing is how are you solving it? And the third one is how are you going to make money? <coughs> Those three need to be yes or yes. I mean, the other ones, you can go deeper. I mean, all of them are important, that's why they are there. But if I exit the building and I have no idea why you're doing that, I'm just not going to tell anyone, I'm not going to invest, and I'm not going to write about it. More questions? And is there a different uh, preparation for the pits depending on the type of investor? I mean, I know that there are different types. There is. I mean, Part of your homework, if you, if we are talking about the whole homework of what you need to do for something like a demo day, is research the investors that are attending. Why? Because some investors are different. Some of them have specific kind of companies in their portfolio, and others have different criteria to invest. So on one side, you're going to have the extremely financial, financially driven people, where you only care about the money and the projections. Is I don't give a shit about your solution. Just prove me that there's a market and prove me that your projections for 25 years are going to make me a lot of money. And uh, then there's others that you will drive in a cab with them and they will write you a check on the way to the airport. So do your homework. I mean, in some sense you have to fine tune it or at least have a plan B if you get those kind of questions. Okay? So just make sure, if you want to be sure, just try to cover the spectrum. Put the things that are going to be the most usual, and then at the back, add the extra things for <coughs> few specific borderline cases that might be moving. More? No? Really? Okay, good then. Well, thank you very much, and enjoy.